Robert Fritz's Structural Consulting Channel. What this is. We present full structural consultations, ones that change people's lives. The idea behind this channel is for you to witness a completely different understanding of the human condition. Here are a few things to know. Structural consulting is not therapy. It is an exploration of the underlying structures in the client's life that produces predictable patterns of behavior. What is structure? Structure is a combination of elements that impact each other. In these sessions, the client's structures are a combination of what they want to create, how reality actually is, and the various concepts that they have. The concepts clients have are usually hidden from them, but these concepts have impact in influencing the client's life patterns. A change of structure will cause a change of the client's patterns. The principle. The underlying structure of anything will determine its behavior. The process involves seeing the actual patterns in the client's life, which leads to a better understanding of the client's underlying structure. The sessions last between one or two hours. We suggest that if you do decide to watch them, do so when you have time to see the entire process. If you want to see more structure consultations, subscribe to the channel. And here is the session. Okay, so what would you like to talk about? I'd like to, um, I'd like to talk about home, finding a home. Why do you want to talk about that? Um, I've, I want to say I've never really had one. I've had places to live. And f for me, home seems like an important piece of um, a foundation from which to create. Why do you think that? Why do I think that? Like walking inside a house and being able to put your bags down, it's like, for me, it would create, well, I think it would create a sense of safety and um, um, permanent domain. And if you didn't have permanent domain, you wouldn't be safe? When you say that out loud, that makes no sense. It wouldn't, I wouldn't. No, but that's what you told me. Yes, yes. So, um, my question exactly. is based on what you told me, not something I made up. Yes, yes. No, I understand. When you said it, I thought, wow, that's really crazy. Well, um, do you think it? Yes. Okay. So whether it's crazy or not, you know. So let's find out um, why you think that. Let's. So why do you think that? Um, no, I'm, I'm not asking about the advantages of having a home or a place you live. You put your bags down and you don't have to move three weeks from now. Yes. Um, I'm really talking about not having that means something different to you than simply not having a home base. Yes. And what is that thing that it means? Why would you feel unsafe? Why would I feel unsafe? only based on experiences of the past. What happened that you weren't safe because you didn't have a home? Because I didn't have a home. Um, I've always had a place to live. Yeah, my question though <laughs> yeah. is, um, you said from experiences you had in the past, and so I'm asking about how, in what ways were you unsafe because you didn't have a place to live in the past? What ways was I unsafe because I didn't have a place to live in the past? Which is what you just told me you. Yes. Right. 
Yes. And and so, you know, what we're doing is we're thinking this thing through together. You know? Yes. So I know it sounds like I'm on the attack here with all your concepts, but um, let's back up and, you know, put them to the test. Yes. See if, yes. They, see if they hold up to scrutiny in light of reality. And it doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Okay. There's this dissonance where I can't even find that. Yeah. Have you always felt unsafe? Yes. Given that you, given that you said you haven't ever had a what you call a, a real home. Yes, I have yeah. always felt unsafe. What in what ways did you feel unsafe? That circumstances could change at any moment. Uh -huh. That um there would be an attack there would be um a hyper vigilance around behaving a certain way around um not getting it right there was even as i say it out loud it's like my mind is or there are thoughts that yeah. are saying that all the time yeah and that pattern feels very connected. Yeah. What, why, do you suppose, um, why do you suppose having a home would be different in regards to your safety? It wouldn't. <laughs> That's what it seems like to me. It's just an idea that you have that the salvation from the mm. fear is... Yeah. Yes. Okay. So good. Okay. Good. Good that we've gotten this far so quickly. Yeah. Was there something in your life that made you um, so fearful or so on guard? Uh, yes. Well, yes. What happened? Um, we lived with the police station attached to the house and the prison cell in the backyard. And mm. there were always people coming to the house in um, various stages of distress. Mm. And my father had to, as the policeman in the small town, had to um, go out on his own and, and deal with certain situations. So there was always a level of um, jumpiness if the phone yeah. rang or if someone knocked on the door. And um, my, I was under the spotlight both at home so that we behaved in a certain way and then at school um, based on um, who I was with my father. daughter. And the a school yeah. teacher's daughter, so there wasn't really. Oh, your mom was a school teacher, and your father was a policeman. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Wow. So wherever I went, there was a level of scrutiny, and yeah. there was also um, we were told um, we had to be better than good. So there was no, um, there was no leeway for getting in trouble anywhere. Um, yeah. yeah. So it was pretty intense. And even, even in the things that I like to do, swimming and different things, there were, it was always a level of um, I'd be swimming along and someone would grab me or um, an and, and attack, not in an ultra-violent way, but in a... Um, Surprising. Yeah. Yes. Jarring. Jarring one. Yeah. Okay, so from that, um, you concluded that the world is dangerous and you're yeah. not safe. Yes. Hmm. And um, the way um, in structural dynamics, what we, what we see is it's not the experience that the person had, it's the conclusion they made from the experience they had. And then act for the rest of their life as if the conclusion were true 
independent of any evidence uh, one way or the other. Yeah. And so it seems like any goal I set or or any anything that I want to do, I'm hanging the 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 code of salvation over it. As partly your motivation. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want something, it has an extra duty to not only be the thing you want, but it's also going to make you safe. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, structurally, you never would have found that because it <laughs> isn't possible. <laughs> well, no. What are you What are you seeing so far? Um, I'm seeing how creative we can be, and and just before you ask that question. Mm. I, I went into the criminal justice system as a career. And so um, I was in positions mm. where I made um, decisions about people's lives and things. And there was so many um, experiences in that role where I was literally under attack. Um, and that's just hilarious to even to consider that making that choice, I could bring safety into a place where there was just violence everywhere. That well, it kind, of makes, it kind of makes sense, though. Yes. Um, that you saw your job in life is to put it right. Yeah. Because there's so much wrong. Yeah. And yeah. in the meantime, it reinforced your notion. Yes. About the world being dangerous because you were hanging out with dangerous people. <laughs> yeah. 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 So in, in a way, you still had evidence and evidence and more evidence because you're always seeing the worst side of human nature. Yes, absolutely. Are you still in law, in, uh, law enforcement or whatever? No, yeah. no, no. How did you get out? <laughs> I was medically retired. I couldn't function anymore. I was oh. rock bottom mentally, physically, emotionally, financially, spiritually. There was nothing. Mm, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, given your concept, you will have developed a uh, control strategy, trying to control things from being dangerous. Uh, not because you're a power-hungry dictator, but <laughs> you're, you're trying to keep things safe. Mm. And in your job, eventually that just ran out. You couldn't mm. couldn't manage it anymore. It was too exhausting and too demanding. Yeah. And you could never accomplish it either. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. what do you do now are you retired or do you have a profession or interestingly enough i um i facilitate one-on-one -on -one and groups in the realm of consent healing from ptsd um, and coaching around being creative and it's fascinating that hmm. i can create incredible results for my uh, clients yeah and for me um not so much not at all yet not at all yeah okay yeah. let's go with that <laughs> <laughs> no sense in not being honest <laughs> exactly yeah and so how, do you, then, how do you how do you manage to help them um become more and more present in their body and um, when those overwhelming sensations arise that they can stay present with it and then take a new action great okay so here's i'm going to translate what you do and see if it's consistent with how you understand it they are living they are living in this traumatic experience this is not just a conclusion they made they're they're actually having um, that kind of fixed 
um, experience. And you, what you're doing is you're teaching them to instead of being in the past, to be in reality. Because in reality, it's really different than being in the war or being under threat. Yes. Hmm. And you find it works. Yeah, and, and, yeah. It, should work. and it should work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now all we have to do is do the same thing for you and <laughs> then we're done. I know. <laughs> I found that hilarious when I saw yeah. that. It's like reality. I'm teaching them to have a great relationship with reality and yeah. mine is running a mark. Yeah, okay. So um, let's, let, let me describe, let me draw for you um, the structure that you're in. And uh, start to work with it. Okay, so I don't know if you know my stuff, but this is dynamic urge of your aspirations and your values and so on. There is reality. And then there are your concepts. Mm -hmm. And all of these are tied together in what I call the causal set, which creates a feedback loop, which I call the reciprocal equilibrium cycle, in that the different elements, are the structure is striving for equilibrium, and it can't reach it. And do you know my two rubber band thing? Yes. OK. So, I mean, here you are and, you know, you've got these two tension resolution systems. And so when you get to a point of being mm -hmm. where you want to be, the tension to move away from where you are is stronger. It's a path of least resistance. It's where energy finds it easiest to go, is to move away. And so that then becomes your oscillating pattern. Now, the concept, though, that you have Um, is that the world's dangerous. And the, the nature of that um, is that it's worst case scenario. So it's not actually, in reality, you would look at risk assessment what's the actual risk and you know sometimes it's acceptable sometimes it's unacceptable and so you manage yourself based on your pattern recognition of how risky something actually is in your case it's never that it's always this mm. And the reason why it's this is you don't look at reality from a risk assessment point of view. Um, in reality, you know, how much risk is there really? Instead, you have imaginary fear. You have fear of imaginary danger, fear of imaginary uh, worst case scenario conceptual fear and then so whatever you do you know especially wanting a house or creating something or um we'll have the tendency in this structure of oscillating and the general conclusion you'll make from that is you can't have what you want and the world's mm -hmm. dangerous yeah and that, that's even by the way how you think about housing yes yeah but it's interesting though because in your work in the work that you do this is what you're doing with the um your clients is you're really helping them create structural tension because they have reality and uh, staying in the present in reality, but also probably thinking about the kind of life they want to live. Yes. And what that does for them is it cuts this rubber band. Yeah. 
And so in the work that you do, it's so great though, in that you really have this direct experience of this. And why it works so well is because you've, you're helping them have a change of underlying structure. So here's where we are. We know how you grew up with this conclusion that you had made. You know how it got reinforced. You know that the compensating strategy for the worst case scenario is trying to control everything to produce safety. Mm -hmm. And um, it's created an oscillating pattern in your life. Yes. Yeah. Overall, I mean, in general, how safe are you? In reality. Really? In reality, as safe as everyone else. Yeah. Well, well. well look, safe. You're not war yeah. Exactly. You know. Okay. You're you're not in a place where there's a. Uh, food insufficiency or you know you're not about to um, um, die of starvation or drought or whatever else the people can suffer from in reality yes so in reality um, what's the truth in reality I'm safe yeah you're pretty safe you know yeah now, your mind says, but anything can happen, right? Pattern recognition says it's unlikely. Mm -hmm. And if you are doing real risk assessment versus worst case scenario, you'll avoid those things that are actually unacceptably risky mm -hmm. and do those things that are accept acceptably risky. You know, the risk is acceptable. Yes. Yeah. What do you think so far? I think uh, with a few questions, it's very easy to get to reality a few of the right questions it's very well, easy because reality is real yeah exactly yeah. if you look in that direction you know all roads lead to reality you just happen yeah. to have to be on the road that's all that's right the right road yeah okay so um it's it's good for you to really teach yourself a few things one is um that you can't control what you can't control mm -hmm. right is that correct? I can't control what I can't control. It's correct. Yeah, because the strategy says, by the way, you can. Yeah. Okay. I I can control what I can't control is the strategy. Is that what you just said? Yeah. Yeah. The compensating yeah. strategy is you can control, you better control everything. Because and I have the power. <laughs> and you have the capacity. And that's why you burnt out in your job. Yeah. Because you couldn't control what you couldn't control. Yeah. And you um, you paid the price. I did. Mm. You know, it wasn't because you were weak. It was because you have an underlying structure that was leading you to the only possibility, which was to burn out in that situation. Yeah. If you had a different structure in that situation, it would have worked fine. And it's an interesting thing because in the new work that you do, you could also have had that structure. And you know, with, with so many people suffering from those experiences, you could have completely felt overwhelmed and um, empathized with the dangers that they're experiencing. But somehow in this new position, you change your underlying structure. Now, what does that tell us? 
it tells us this, it tells us there's possibility around um, in in a different structure there's possibility for advancement well the, that you can make it work yeah 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 but it also tells us that you can change you can change yeah. from one structure to another you can move from a rocking chair to a car you can change yeah. from an oscillating to an advancing structure but you have to stay in touch with reality exactly as you're teaching and supporting um, the people that you work with yes hmm. What are you thinking about? I'm thinking about, um, you know, sitting in a session with a client yeah. and how present to reality I can be in right. relation to watching their body, watching their breath mm -hmm. and watching, um, noticing their facial expressions and even saying this out loud because my mind wanted to go down the story well if you can't do it for yourself how can you possibly do it but I had to bring it back to okay what do I actually do in a session and I'm noticing um, little you know changes in breath and changes in face and changes in body movement um, and well, see, in a way it's a funny thing that your mind which is trying to hold on to the concept by the way and the reason it is, it, it feels like you'll be in danger if you don't have this magic feather to hold on to. The, the question of how can you teach others if you can't do it yourself? Well, of course you can do it yourself. And of course, you don't have to necessarily be doing it yourself to teach others because it's the structure, not you personally. You're teaching them a structure that you ha happen not to be living in. But if you did live in that structure, you would have the same advantages that you're teaching them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so liberating to know that it's the structure. Well, it is because it's based on a combination of your aspirations and values, reality, and the concepts. And the concept in this case, you better look out. And you come by it honestly, really, growing up <laughs> in a jail <laughs> with bad guys all the time coming in and out. Yeah. And people would come and if they if they'd been at the pub and had a lot of alcohol and didn't want to walk home to their home and the prison cell was closer, they would just come and sleep in it and we'd be out there playing the next morning and someone would walk out and you know we didn't know what they were doing uh, wow well. mm -hmm. yeah it's so it's so interesting that i mean these sessions i've been doing with people for the youtube channel when it comes to this particular structure often there's an actual event or an experience that people have that generates the conclusion that the world's not safe. As it is in this case. Mm -hmm. You know, from my point of view, this is a very simple structure. Mm -hmm. And if we Concepts can't exist in light of reality. Concepts are always not about reality. They're saying, mm -hmm. since you don't, can't see reality, you create a theory, you create a concept, you create a belief system, you create speculation. And in your case, the motivation for that was to produce safety in a dangerous world. Mm -hmm. But in fact, you live in a fairly safe world yes and you had a bad experience when you burnt out based on the underlying structure you were trying to maintain mm -hmm. which 
was never going to be, and you could only uh, burn out in that um, in that quest. There was, there was no way you could have won under in that underlying structure. Yeah. Um, and what's so nice, though, is that you've really, in your new work, you've actually work in a different structure. So you know all about that. And now you know about you. Yeah. Yes. And it's, I, I find it quite ironic and hilarious and funny and funny um, on so many levels and powerful in relation to um, well you know it never occurred to you and never probably would have occurred to you even though you do the work you do because the concept is has been so strongly seated in your mind and yeah. that when you try to think it through on your own you'll just get pictures of how dangerous the world is Yes. And even, even I can look at my life and all the different aspects of it and, and see that I created, you know, the world is and, and whatever. And yet I still was, that, was unable to move forward. Yeah. And so then the risk assessment, like in a in a day to day, um, say I have to write an email or write a um, a marketing, you know. And clients find me. I don't do any marketing. I'm just on a website. My clients are people who know me, and so I have not done any of those actions to put myself even more visible. And it comes back to that statement of trying to control what I can't control and, and then doing a risk assessment on that. Mm, yeah. What I think I'm trying to control. Mm. I mean, there are things you can control, <laughs> of course. Yeah. But that's not in the realm of, that's more in the realm of the creative process than it is in the realm of avoiding danger. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like any action I take, mm. it's like you can look at it with curiosity. Oh, is this one of avoiding danger or is this one of creating? Well, if you're in reality, you'll know the difference. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's really almost exactly the same as you're teaching the folks that you support. Yeah. Which is good because you can teach them this very helpful thing yeah and at the same time on your own practice it and have the direct experience of it as well yeah yeah you know it's not that you've had um pds it's it's like you've almost had it <laughs> i know there were very there are a number of incidences absolutely inside of yeah that thing absolutely there yeah. were a number of attacks. The difference, though, is that they actually are suffering from um, a reference point of an experience. So they are reliving and um, re-experiencing the danger. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is you're saying, okay, let's be in reality, be present in reality. Mm -hmm. and in yeah. reality, that thing is over. Yeah. Which it is, which it's over. Yeah. And so you're teaching them exactly what you need to learn in this case, which is to really focus your attention on reality. And in reality, there's no place for concepts. Yeah. Yeah. So how are things looking now and what's going on with you? 
Um, I was just about to say, it's just, uh, it's just take the action towards what it is you want to create. Just take that action. No, it's not necessarily taking action. It's being in reality. And if there's an action to take, take it. And if there isn't, don't. <laughs> if there isn't, don't. <laughs> Let's have an economy of means here. <laughs> The reason you translated into that take action thing is part of you your control help. strategy. <laughs> you wanted you were looking for something to do. And in a way, if you're in reality, there's nothing you nothing to do in particular, is there? Only if I want to, there's nothing to do in reality. In particular, no. Yeah. If I want to create something, it's getting that picture of reality, the picture of what I want to recreate, and taking those steps. And, current, and having current reality. Yeah, yeah. Structural tension and yeah. result, current reality, action steps. What the yeah. action there, those motivated by the um, goal of creating the outcome you want. Yeah, yeah. But it's not action in the sake of doing something. But you see how your mind still is looking for the right system, the right process, the right thing to do, the right policy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I've probably spent, I've probably spent two mortgages on training on the right way to do it or the right, yeah, it's crazy when I look at that. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you, you know, so we all spend money in ways that don't work as well as we would like them to from time to time. Yeah, exactly. But the, the point is don't get, because you've paid the money, you have the investment, you don't, you don't have to hold on to the ideas. No, exactly. <laughs> you can change your mind. Yeah, I can. Yeah. But you can see how your mind is looking for, where's the ground here? Yeah. Because you're feeling probably disoriented, I imagine. Yeah. I was feeling disoriented right at the start when you asked me those questions. There was this cognitive dissonance because there's a part of me that wanted to answer um, in, in the con through the concept lens, but there was this other part of me that knew that it was just, it was not, it, it just wasn't real. Because you're sane. Yeah. See, if you weren't sane, if you actually were crazy, you wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you have the disadvantage of being sane. Yeah. So in a way, and your mind, your mind will say, "Yeah, come on, reality really is this." Yeah. yeah. And and I think that dissonance that I'm experiencing right now is that pattern of well, there has to be a next step, like, <laughs> what is the next step? And it's going, and, and, and I can feel my body just almost like, you know, those punching things that would just bounce yeah, back. Yeah, keeps, got, yeah, right. Yeah, and it's just trying to find itself uh, differently. Okay. Here, I'd like you to just say this to teach this to your mind and see if you think it's true as well. That there's nothing you have to do. Wow. Is it true or not true? <laughs> it's true. There's nothing I have to do. And, okay. and See, but your concept says there is something you have to do. And then you're looking for the thing. And it's interesting, the body experience, when I really got, there's nothing I have to do. <laughs> That's different in the body. That's really yeah. different. There's nothing I have to do. Oh, yeah. I want to cry. It's okay, but say it a few times. Teach it to your mind. Teach it to yourself. And by the way, if you want to cry, cry. It's okay. There's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But all, but you don't even try to control that. But um, just say it because it's you're teaching it to your mind, and because you think it's true, and because it is true. There's there's nothing I have to do. There's nothing I have to do. There's nothing I have to do. 
there's there's nothing I have to do. <laughs> there's nothing I have to do. There's nothing I have to do. Do you see the implication of that in your life? Absolutely. Absolutely, in every area. There's nothing I have to do. If I think back, maybe another conclusion you made when you were a kid because of your upbringing and the policeman's daughter and the teacher's daughter, she had to be a good girl. Oh, it was explicit. <laughs> we had to be better than good. It was yeah. explicit. So that they were teaching you there's something you have to do. Yeah. At least on the level of behavior, not necessarily on the level of accomplishment. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There's nothing I have to do. <laughs> There's nothing I have to do. Yeah. <sighs> and that, that's incredibly disorienting because your mind is saying, well, no, you have to do this and you have to do that. It's going to present it you is. with all kinds of things you have to do, which you don't have to do. I just had like a, a movie of all the doing of that, that urge to get up and do and fix. Yeah. And, yeah. and mm -hmm. I didn't have to do any of it. No. And in the meantime, you have aspirations, you have values. Yeah. One yeah. of your values is to support people and you're in a really nice position to do that. Yeah. And you've been doing it. I mean, the, the great thing about it is independent of your structure in your personal life, in your yeah. professional life, you know, you got structural tension going on all the time and you're teaching these folks how to have that in their lives and it's really working for them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and hilarious, something that's really hilarious. The work that I really love and I'm teaching in groups is choosing over doing. <laughs> Isn't irony a bitch? <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah. My God. Life is hilarious, isn't it? Yeah. Well, a choice means you can do it or not do it. Exactly. An obligation means you have to do it. You have no choice. Yeah. Yeah. What's the implication for freedom in your life now? I only can, I I can do what I want to do. I can do what I want to do. Yeah. And I can, and I can, I can be present in reality, in my own creations, in a well, way that. Where, well, that, like I like to say, that's where the action is. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Creating only happens in reality. It doesn't happen anywhere else, by the way. Yes. And I can see how I tried to force so many things. Mm. And that level of control, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I get to be a creator. Because the subtext was your life dependent on it. Yeah. You can imagine the stress that that created in you. It did create chronic somewhat. Stress. Chronic stress. Yeah. And also um, chronic um, stagnation. Mm. Where I, yeah being stopped and stuck. Yeah, because you wouldn't want to get in trouble. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. And my sister played, and I played cops and robbers with my dad's gun once, you know, and I was the robber. And so she's chasing after me with dad's gun. And oh, it's geez. like, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. Wow. Was yeah. the gun loaded? Yeah. <laughs> but it had a safety catch. 
Yeah. Okay. But that was actual real. That was real danger. Just to say, <laughs> that's not imaginary. No. 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 Yeah. And yeah. I used to. I used to have to go out to the prison, maximum security men's prison and be in a cell with a prisoner. And and the funny thing was, this is something that I couldn't really get my head around was I had the power in that position that I would say whether or not the person stayed in jail or not. And there there was one situation where I had an expectation. There were th- I was in a room with three men. One was a prisoner, one was a prison guard, one was a police officer. Mm-hmm. And my expectation was that the, you know, the corrective services people were there for my safety. Right. They put the prisoner between me and the door. And this prisoner, like the energy that was coming from him was terrifying. And my whole, I'm shaking, I'm absolutely shaking. Mm. And I remember saying, I, I'm going to just get out of this without him seeing the impact he had on me. Mm. But I wanted to actually scream to these officers, what about me? What about my safety? Yeah. And I just held it together. And then I said, bail refused, take him away. And so on, on this incredible level, I had the power of his incarceration, but I had no personal power that I could access and I just did this good girl thing of, you know, I'm just going to suffer through it until he gets away. And then they took him away and there's this moment where I just leant back against a door just to take a breath and the door opened behind me and there was this massive prisoner, like he took up the whole door frame and I'm literally a inches away and I'm looking up and I could see just these tiny bits of light above his shoulders and he's looking down at me like this and he goes got any sunscreen and and I said no and he just walked away and and just what a great what a great line (laughs) I know you think you think something mean would come out of his mouth or something, <laughs> and just like that, that particular experience just stayed in my body and my mind for a long time, because mm. I knew I that that guy that I bail refused him, he got out of jail long before I did, inside of the terror that was in my body. Yeah. I mean, that particular experience is in the realm of life insane. And, and well, speak. also, there's a couple of things about it, though, that aren't imaginary. And that no. was the guy was really intimidating and you felt intimidated, independent yeah. of that you had jurisdictional power over what would happen next that's independent of the threat that he presented which wasn't imaginary no no yeah yeah yes and and the two guys who were supposed to protect you were hanging back (laughs) they didn't care and funnily uh, enough, that happened a few they, times. They may, they may not have noticed. And their job wasn't to protect me. And that's, not, you know, I really yeah. got the expectations. Yeah. I hung on both of them. I see. The prison, you know, he. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's 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 been when I look back at certain incidents in my life, and. Like there might have been a prisoner. Well, there were a few incidents where there was a prisoner and there was um, two big, burly police officers, you know, massive, six foot, and I'm only five foot tall. And um, they just, because this other prisoner had some very, very challenging social behaviours where he would defecate at will and just throw it at everybody. And 
I had to interact with this guy and have, you know, jurisdictional power. Mm. But the police officers wouldn't control his physicality and they allowed him to get really close to me as well. And, you know, I just had to scream at them and just say, you know, what are you doing? He shouldn't be here. And so it's like. And what did they do after you did that? Well, they went and got him and brought him because they let him come into where I was physically situated, which was, you know, so it's um, it's fascinating just to see that pattern from this perspective, looking back at different situations that happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. And even, yeah, and even assaults on my physical body how I tried to control it, but still in the realm of being the good girl. <laughs> like like mommy and daddy taught you. <laughs> exactly, very well. There's nothing I have to do. There's nothing I have to do. True? This is true. It's nothing I have to do. Yeah. How do you feel right now physically? <sighs> I feel a sense of relief, actually. Mm-hmm. You feel like a burden's been taken off your shoulders. Yeah, yeah, and there's nothing I have to do. Do you feel free? I feel free. Yeah. I feel free. Like, can I tell you one more story? Sure. So I'd gone out for dinner with a group of friends. We're at a hotel in Balmain, and you could see something was happening outside of the hotel. There was just something mm -hmm. happening outside of the hotel. And I thought to myself, this is not my circus. I don't need to go and have a look. And then after a little while, I got up and there were three bikers with, they had a guy on the ground and they're bashing this guy and they're kicking him and hitting him with a, their helmets. There's at least 50 people watching, people looking over their balconies and people all over the place. And I yelled out, stop it, you bastards, stop it. And they mm -hmm. did. But I'm the only person that said anything. And so they stopped beating this guy. By the way, that's not your control strategy. Oh, that's okay. Your, those are your values. Right. Okay. It's like your dynamic urge in play. You had structural tension at that moment. You, okay, you got weren't it. thinking about danger. You were thinking about doing what was right. Yeah. And you weren't even trying to be a good person. You were just basically trying to uh, right or wrong and stop uh, something bad from happening. Yeah, right. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> Well, funnily enough, this guy started walking towards me, one of the guys that was assaulting the other guy. And I thought, right, okay, Karen, you know, this is the consequences of that action. And he starts walking towards me. I thought, I'm just going to stand here. And he comes right up to me and he points to a motorbike that, it, that was on its side. And he said, he knocked my bike over. And I said, not good enough. And he just walked away. <laughs> Away. Great. <laughs> you should okay. be writing these stories down. You know, they're really so interesting. Fascinating. And what's interesting about them also is they they really don't always come out the way a cliche would. <laughs> you know? Do you have any sun tan lotion? <laughs> I know. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was quite funny. But then everyone in the hotel knew it was me that did it. Yeah. And even the publican came up to me, what did you do? Blah, blah, blah. And, and then I felt the terror because I was under the spotlight. Like people knew it was me. I just had to get out of there. That was my dynamic urge. I'm out of here. <laughs> no, that was you falling back into your, the world's a dangerous place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you didn't and have I, that going, and you know, if you didn't have that going on, you you could have taken some bows. <laughs> could have been on the front page. <laughs> you could say yes, thank you very much. Yes, I did do that. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything else we have to do? Are, are we done? No, I was just realizing the freedom of there's nothing I have to do. Yeah. <sighs> And it's true, isn't it? 
Yeah, it is true. Yeah. There's nothing it's not, I have to it, do. Well, the important thing is to know it's it's not one concept over another concept. It's looking at reality and saying and calling it like it is and you're describing yeah. correctly. And so then, because I love telling improvised stories, there's this body of work that, that I think saved my life, really, um, called Interplay, and it's just improvised, allowing the body spirit to arise. And I think that was probably my first taste of reality, because mm -hmm. it was just allowing the body to move in a way or to tell story. And the the thing that I love most of all is someone just giving me a word and then I'm just so delighted to see what I can create with that through movement and song and yeah, yeah because yeah. you're in a very different structure yeah and, yeah. The, and in, in a way the game of that was you could not control yeah you had to be completely free yeah 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 Right. And even even though I wanted to tell more stories on a public stage, the idea of um, uh, learning every word by heart. You mean controlling every word you say? Exactly. <laughs> I've, just, I've just never wanted to do it, <laughs> even though I know I've got neither, a lot. Of... Neither would I <laughs> want to do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's really powerful in, in looking at where I've been stopped as well about that. But, but yeah, I just love getting up and just telling a story because mm -hmm. I never know what's going to come out. Yeah. yeah. But thank you, Robert. That's been can powerful. You can you describe a little bit of, for the people watching this, what was it like doing a structural consultation with me? Um, it was, it was, it was really safe. <laughs> no, what I felt, um, I just could, with those questions, the questions were so powerful because they were so disconcerting and there, it was such an interruption to um, uh a practice way of being that I've inhabited. And mm. so the questions being so powerfully disruptive, it just took a heartbeat that I could feel the dissonance and know that I was uh, creating something that wasn't real. Mm. Uh, and I wasn't even creating it. It was like I was attempting con to control. It was like mm. the questions were so powerfully disruptive that there was no other thing to do than see reality or be present. Well, no, there was reality. one. There was one other element in that, and that's um, your intellectual honesty. Okay. You know, that, that's something you you had the entire time, um, and that's very important. Is um, even when it wasn't easy, mm. you went for the truth. Yeah. Always. So, yeah. I mean, I, that's just part of your values too, you know, aspirations and values, which yeah. can become a major organizing principle in your life. Yes, yeah. yes. And it was so noticeable and, and, and uh, relieving myself of the burden. It's like, I just want to dance. There's, there's just this capacity of lightness of being. Right. that I have not experienced. Mm, wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Well, stay on. I'm going to uh, stop the recording now so I can say goodbye to you after the thing. And thanks for being my client. Thank you.